Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, Bill Reel and I are going to take a look at the young single adult devotional that was broadcast from Hawaii this past Sunday, January 13th, 2019, featuring Elder and Sister Renland. Good morning, Bill Reel. Good morning, RFM. I'll tell you just uh, before we jump into this, people are loving you and I having these conversations, and uh, uh, you and I are already in the works talking about a part three of the Book of Abraham, so people can expect that on the way, uh, but it's been a lot of fun to sit down with you and have these conversations, and I I think what people are liking, and you and I are talking about this behind the scenes, you know quite a few things, and I know quite a few things, but we tend to fill in the gaps of each other pretty well, and I just I find these conversations to be exciting, and I'm looking forward to this one. Well, thank you, Bill. I enjoy it very much, too. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of background on this talk given by Elder Renland, as well as his wife. She gets to play a minor, though significant, role in delivering this address. The background, first off, has to do with a leaked video of a presentation that Elder Renland gave to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles back in 2008. This was before he was called as an apostle, but he was still, I believe, a general authority in a supervisory capacity over the young single adults. So are you familiar with what I'm talking about, Bill? Uh, is this the one on why uh, our young people are leaving the church? Exactly. And giving some remarkable statistics from back in 2008. Now, as you and I both know, the church is extremely reluctant to talk about activity rates and the actual active membership in the LDS church. They'd rather focus on the 15 million names they have on the rolls rather than talking about the people who are actually active. And apparently the activity rates of the young single adults even 10 years ago was extremely low and so much so that it caused this presentation that was given that was leaked by Mormon leaks and it was I think termed as somewhat of an emergency and different plans were put forward in order to try and change the situation for the better. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I mean, they give the numbers in there, which I'm sure you're going to share here in a second. But what more importantly to me was this was back in 2008 and what the conversations were then. And now here we are a decade later and I'm looking around at the church and I'm seeing how many conversations are occurring around doubt and people leaving and around issues that people are having uh, a loss of faith over. And I've got to believe the situation has only gotten worse in the last decade. Yes. And we talked about this uh, somewhat off the air. We'll talk about it now on the air. When I joined the church back in 1978, and also apparently when you joined the church back in 1997, 96, 96, 96. was it? Yep. We didn't hear these kind of talks given about doubts in the church ever, to my recollection. What was your recollection, Bill? Yeah, I, I knew one person in our entire stake who, in the first decade of my time in the church, left over church history issues. The church never addressed these things. And the things the church did address, you and I were talking about this, those things aren't even anywhere on the radar anymore. Uh, keeping journals is one that you and I were talking about. Another one is the great apostasy. Uh, those things were highly emphasized. And those things are gone today. And, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, um, but I will simply say that there are reasons why those things are no longer useful. Yes, and the reasons that talking about doubt are necessary, I think now, is because of the people who are leaving the church, the people who are becoming inactive in the church. And it was apparent from this leak that in 2008, young adults were leaving the church so much that one of the things they did to help with the situation was to lower the missionary age. Yeah. And the numbers, I think it's 75%. I think it was actually 73 in 2008. 73% of all of our young members were inactive by the age of 21. Yes. And so I can only imagine it has not gotten better since that time. Now, also, this is not the first talk that's being given about dealing with doubts about the church. You and I have also covered a prior interview that was given with church historian Stephen Harper this past summer that went up on the Mormon channel in which he deals with the issue. I think it was titled, 
how to deal with questions about church history when actually when we were done listening to it and talking about it, we felt it should have been more properly titled How to Avoid Dealing with Questions About Church History. Also this past summer, Elder Cook and two church historians appeared at Nauvoo for another worldwide broadcast. I think that was another young adult devotional dealing with questions about church history in which they actually tried to field some questions about church history. Some they did a better job with than others. Typically, the ones that were more difficult, Elder Cook handed off to one of the other two church historians, and I think it was very much a mixed bag there as to how effectively they answer these questions. But this is something that is happening over and over and over again. This is at least three of them in the past year, including the Elder Renland and Sister Renland talk from Hawaii on January 13th. Now, Elder and Sister Renland are not going to talk about any specific questions about church history. Instead, there are two main goals and messages in their talk. And the first main message is that if anybody leaves the church, they are an absolute fool. They are an idiot. They are ungrateful. They are immature. They are petulant. They are unappreciative. And so the first thing is to reemphasize this theme that we have in the church, telling stories about people who have left the church, whether it's Simon's writer leaving the church because his last name was spelled wrong in a revelation, or leaving the church over uh, a dispute about milk strippings with Thomas Marsh, as you'll recall, when those really are not the reasons these people left, but the goal is to try and make it look like the only reason a person would leave the church are for stupid reasons, and therefore, if somebody leaves the church, they have to be stupid. Yeah, and there's certainly a lot of that in this. Um, I, I I have to admit, I mean, listen to this a couple of times, and this talk felt very, you know, deeply troubling. At least with Stephen Harper, there was a sense of empathy and compassion for those who lose faith, and and Brother Harper even admitted that he still had some questions. Um, even in the Quentin Cook fireside with uh, Matt Groh and Kate Holbrook. And uh, even in that, you could sense a little bit of compassion kind of for those who have doubts. This one seemed to really be more of a shaming and blaming mechanism used in in this uh, brother and sister, elder and sister Runland presentation. Yes. So that's the first message. The second overwhelming message, which is part two of their devotional, is that you should not trust somebody who has left the church. You should not listen to them. You should not pay any attention to their information that they give you. Instead, you should give absolute and complete heed and trust to what you hear from the leaders of the church because those are the only reliable sources on which you can depend to get the scoop, the true scoop, the full scoop about church history and what the church is really about. Yeah, which which also isn't true. <laughs> No, it's not, but there's no question and answer session on this. But let's go ahead. We'll talk about it. They start off with this extended uh, metaphor. They call it a parable, which Elder Renlund came up with. And he talked about it several months ago at some other presentation. Uh, I had actually predicted, knowing that he had talked about it several months ago, I predicted that when I heard that he was going to be doing this young single adult devotional from Hawaii, that he would once again use this analogy because the subject of the devotional was how to overcome doubt with faith. So obviously he's going to bring this up again. And what they've done is not only brought it up again, they have totally made it ready for prime time. There is animation that goes along with this parable. They have given more details to the parable to make it even more ridiculous that this young man would leave the boat after being rescued by the kindly sailor. Are we ready to play that? Yeah, and I just want to note before we jump into it, the idea that all parables are going to fall short, all analogies are going to miss the mark on some level. So as as RFM and I go through this, we're not expecting this to be a dead ringer for the truth. Uh, but what I think you're going to find as the listener, as we dissect the various portions of this, is that this this is said from a perspective that is deeply inaccurate. Uh, and, and I think you'll see that as we begin to point these out. Okay, play the tape. We feel prompted to discuss a topic that has been on our minds for many months, faith and doubt. 
Last year in June, we shared a parable in the annual training broadcast for instructors in seminaries and institutes of religion. As we begin, we want to share the same parable with you. Imagine having capsized in a boat while sailing in the ocean. You're wearing a life preserver and have been swimming for hours toward what you believe is the nearest shore, but you can't be sure. You've become extremely dehydrated, so every time you start swimming, you become lightheaded and fatigued. By your best estimates, the shore is 30 kilometers or 18 miles away. You fear for your life because you can't swim that far. In the distance, you hear a small engine. The sound seems to be coming toward you. Your hope of rescue soars. As you look, you see a small fishing boat approaching. Oh, thank heavens, you think. The captain sees me. The boat stops and the kindly, weather-beaten fisherman helps you on board. Gratefully, you crawl to a seat in the boat, breathing a sigh of relief. The fisherman gives you a canteen of water and some soda crackers. You consume them greedily. The water and soda crackers provide enough nourishment for you to recover. You're so relieved and happy. You are on your way home. As you begin to revive and start feeling better, you begin to pay attention to some things you hadn't really noticed before. The water from the canteen is a bit stale and not what you would have preferred, like Evian or Perrier. The crackers tasted good, but what you really wanted was some delicatessen meat, followed by a chocolate croissant. You also notice that the fisherman wears worn boots and blue jeans. The sweatband on his hat is stained, and he seems to be hard of hearing. You note that the boat is well used and that there are dents in the right side of the bow. Some of the paint is chipped and peeling. You see that when the fisherman relaxes his grip on the rudder, the boat pulls to the right. You begin to worry that this boat and this captain cannot provide you the rescue you need. You ask the fisherman about the dents and the rudder. He says he hasn't worried about those things because he's steered the boat to and from the fishing grounds over the same route day in and day out for decades. The boat has always gotten him safely and reliably where he wanted to go. You're stunned. How could he not worry about the dents and the steering? And why could the nourishment not have been more to your liking? The more you focus on the boat and the fisherman, the more concerned you become. You question your decision to get on board in the first place. Your anxiety begins to grow. Finally, you demand that the fisherman stop the boat and let you back in the water. Even though you're still more than 20 kilometers or 12 miles away from shore, You can't stand the idea of being in the boat. With sadness, the fisherman stops the boat and helps you back in the ocean. (laughs) You're on your own again. Well, consider this story as a parable in which the boat represents the church and the fisherman represents those who serve in the church. The sole purpose of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is to help Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ in their work to bring to pass the eternal life of God's children. It provides the covenant path, the way to return to our Heavenly Father. So you can see how this parable is framed in such a way as that the young man, the boy who is rescued from the ocean by the kindly fisherman, is the member of the church who ends up leaving the church over church history issues. That will become apparent in the next analogy. And you can see how this person is being represented as somebody who is ungrateful, petulant, immature, and completely ridiculous. So that's the first thing to do is to frame people in that way. Now, the other thing I want to say, and there's actually a few things I want to say about this parable, because it has raised a lot of concern among members of the church who have listened to it, mainly because it does frame people who end up becoming disillusioned with the church because of its history and their learning of the church history in this fashion. When I joined the church in 1978, you would never have heard a parable of this sort. Think about it. An apostle of Jesus Christ, Elder Renland, is characterizing the one and only true church of Jesus Christ upon the face of the entire earth 
as a dinghy, a worn out little dinghy with peeling and chipped paint, dents on the side, being captained by a fisherman who is hard of hearing, who sometimes lets go of the rudder and it pulls to the right. And this is remarkable to me because when I joined the church, if the church had been characterized in a parable like this, it would not have been a little worn out dinghy with dents on the side. It would have been a carnival cruise liner. It would have been a battleship. It would have been an aircraft carrier. So just the very fact that the church now is reduced to describing itself in a parable as a little worn out dinghy in this fashion is extremely revealing. Your thoughts, Bill? So I'm with you. Back when I was uh, a newly baptized member, uh, there was so little focus on those who left to the point where an apostle, um, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, who was passed away by the time I had joined the church, but whose works and writings were uh, thrown at me fast and furious uh, within Mormonism. I was very familiar with almost all of the writings of Bruce R. McConkie in his formal books and his speeches. There's a famous uh, quote by him regarding the caravan moves on. The church is like a great caravan, organized, prepared, following an appointed course, with its captains of tens and captains of hundreds all in place. What does it matter if a few barking dogs snap at the, wheels of the, at the heels of the weary travelers or that predators claim those few who fall by the way? The caravan moves on. It essentially says that, you know, the church is going to move on. We're building the kingdom of God and there's going to be some people who fall off the caravan and we're just, we don't even have time to go back and pick them up. They're... They're simply in our rearview mirror, and they're gone. Like, there's no sense to even worry about them. Uh, this, this good ship Zion, this kingdom of God on earth, this true and living church is going to move forward. And if we lose a few people, so be it. Yes. And the other thing about it is, is that they're talking about uh, the food that the leader of the church, the leaders of the church now give to this young boy are crackers that are stale what is it? The crackers are stale. The water's stale. I think everything's stale. He's just got water. And, <laughs> you know, it's all substandard. First off, it's just water and crackers, and they're both stale. This is completely different. What I was taught was that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only church that can give you the fullness of the gospel, that this is the living water that springs up unto life everlasting. It's not stale water from a canteen, and it is a complete banquet. It is a feast to sit at and eat whatever we want, not crackers that are stale. Living water and the bread of life. And the other thing that comes along with this is, again, painting this kid, this young person, as a spoiled brat who's used to being fed... Uh, I guess on uh, caviar dreams and champagne wishes, uh, <laughs> right? So there's this idea that you know here he is on Evian, you know bottles of Evian water, and uh, what was the other one, Perrier, or so there's this idea that this person is just raised on luxury, raised on having the good stuff. Uh, another thing that I made a note of here as in this early telling of this parable is the idea that the parable starts off with this kid having uh, capsized his boat and now he's stranded in the ocean, the reality is most people are born into the church. Um, very f little of the church membership comes by way of being converts at any given time. Almost everyone in the church at this moment is a second generation or later, which means that you were born on the boat. Uh, you were born on this ship. And that changes the analogy drastically, which I'll get to here in a little bit as we work through this. Because um, I've got a parable myself that I'd like to share. But I want to simply note, like, it's not that we were on some other boat and it capsized. And now we're in the ocean and we need rescued. No, no, no. We started off on this boat. We've seen how this boat operates. We've looked at it. We've watched it. We've walked its decks. We've been down below. Uh, if we sense problems, it's because we've sensed them over a lifetime of discovery. Right. And if I can elaborate a little bit on this parable, I hope I'm not taking any of your thoughts because these just came to me this morning. That even if I give this parable 
its context that there is a boy who's rescued from the water because his boat capsized and now he gets picked up by this kindly fisherman. The shore represents eternal life. That's what Sister Renlin just got done saying. And we can understand that in the parable. The shore represents eternal life. The boat is the church. And even though she says the fisherman is those who serve in the church, we know what she really means. Those are the leaders of the church. This is not a trip of 15 miles to be dropped off at shore. Even if we take it within the context of the way they're saying it and elaborate it within that same context, this is a parable in which the boy is rescued. He's put into this boat with this kindly fisherman. By the way, I've also got to say, I find it humorous that they characterize the captain of the boat as deaf. They say hard of hearing, he's deaf, but then they say these are the leaders of the church. Yeah, that seems to represent them pretty well (laughs) as people raise criticisms in a, a voice of warning that, you know, we're hurting people who aren't fitting the mold. We're hurting our children in one-on-one interviews. We're hurting those who uh, are homosexual. We're hurting those who have questions and doubts. And it feels like nobody's listening. Right, because they're hard of hearing. Now, in this way, I think the parable is inadvertently spot on. He also mentions that when the captain takes his hands off the rudder, excuse me, when is the captain taking his hands off the rudder? When are the church leaders taking their hands off the rudder and then the boat pulls to the right? That's really an interesting statement. Now, honestly, I think that what they're doing is they're trying to throw in a bunch of little details about why it is that this kid's having trouble having faith in the leaders of the church and the captain of the boat. But they end up saying some things that sort of could have humorous interpretations if you think about them too long. Yeah, there are some accuracies here in the parable. (laughs) Yes, inadvertent accuracies. So this kid, though, the real parable is this. He's not going for 18 miles or now 12 miles, apparently, when he finally asks to get off. The parable is this. He's picked up by the fisherman and the fisherman tells him, I will take you to shore and I will save you. But you have to spend the rest of your life in this boat. This isn't just a few hour trip to shore and I'll drop you off and you can live the rest of your life. No, that's eternal life. Remember, Bill, you don't get there till after you die. So you have to spend young boy the rest of your life in this boat. And while you're in this boat, says the kindly captain, you have to do everything I tell you to do. And if you don't do everything I tell you to do, then you're going to get thrown off the boat. And on top of all of that, after you die, little boy, after you die, then I will take you to shore and deposit your body on the shore And bring you back to life and you'll have this wonderful eternal life on shore in this beautiful garden that exists there that you've never seen, that you don't know about, but that I'm telling you exists. So that's the first part of the parable in context. Your thoughts, Bill? Yeah, you look at the stale crackers and the stale water, and it's not just that the quality isn't that good. It's also that you realize there is a a deplenished supply of those uh, and it's getting smaller by the moment. Right. And so even though this is cast in terms of the fisherman saves your life, you could look at it that way. But the other side of the coin is a little bit more disturbing because the captain actually wants to take your life. He wants to take the rest of your life in this little boat and force you to do everything that he says for you to do with the promise based upon the captain's word alone that after you spent your whole life in the boat doing everything he tells you to do, he will put you on shore. He'll bring you back to life or you'll be brought back to life and live forever in paradise. Now, about five years after you've been on this boat, maybe 10 years, it depends from person to person. But after you've been on this boat for a number of years, now you start noticing that there are problems with the boat. You start noticing that there are problems with the captain of the ship. And to extend the parable accurately, I believe, you start noticing that the boat is taking on water and you get out a bucket and you start bailing the water out of the boat because you don't want the boat to sink because you believe that your eternal life depends upon this boat remaining afloat and staying in the boat because you have taken the word and believed the captain of the ship. But you keep bailing, you keep bailing, you keep bailing. And in spite of your best efforts, more and more water comes in. It's coming in faster than you can bail it out. And you start telling the captain, 
There's water coming in. There's water coming in. We need to do something about this. The captain, once again being somewhat hard of hearing, doesn't hear what you're saying, or at least doesn't appear to hear what you're saying. Finally, he starts noticing that you're talking to him about there being water in the boat. And his response is, don't pay any attention to the water coming into the boat. There is no water coming into the boat. You just need to listen to me that there's no water coming into the boat and you'll be fine and this boat won't sink. Your thoughts? Yeah, and on top of that, every time he does take your suggestion, he then takes credit for it. He takes credit for it? Right. So in in the church, it seems like, for instance, recently with these temple changes, they've all come from criticism from uh, the members below saying like, look, this patriarchy is hurting us. And then the church makes the change and then takes credit and says, no, 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 no. What really happened is we went into the temple on Thursday. We've been praying and God told us to change the temple ordinances. It has nothing to do with being in response to those who raise a warning voice down below. It's us. We did it congratulate us, pat us on the back. Good job, LDS leadership. So anytime that you tell the captain of this little dinghy that he, something needs to be fixed or a hole needs to be plugged, and he's, and he's never listening except once in a great while when he actually does plug a hole, he then pats himself on the back and takes credit for the great idea. I see what you're saying now. And every now and again, he'll paint some parts of the boat. Every now and again, he'll fix some of the dents in the boat but he never seems to want to get around to doing anything about plugging the hole in the bottom of the boat that is causing all of this water to get in. And to once again extend the metaphor, you're not the only boy on this boat. There are other boys and girls on the boat. By the way, once again, notice how infantilizing this parable is. The church does a horrible job of treating its members like infants for their entire life, talking down to them giving, frankly, juvenile stories and parables like this and weak messages that are really more adapted to small children than young adults who are college age and even older than that. But even in the parable itself, it's a boy who gets picked up by this old, seasoned, kindly fisherman. So within the context of the parable, once again, we see this pension of the church to infantilize its members. But this boy is not the only one on the boat. There are other children. Of course, they have to remain children, Bill, in order to go along with the parable. There are other children on the boat and other children start pointing at the water and saying, look, there's water coming in. There's water coming in. We need to do something about the water coming in. We're going to sink. And you start paying attention to them and thinking this water coming in is a problem. But the captain of the ship now, as we go on with the talk, right, we'll find out that the captain of the ship says, don't listen to the other boys and girls on the boat talking about the water coming in. There is no water coming in. Don't pay any attention to the water. Don't look at the water and don't listen to those other boys and girls talking about the water coming in. Just trust me. I will get you safely to shore after you spend your whole life in the boat doing everything I say and after you die. Yeah, there are other voices that are expressing what the problems are and doing so with data, doing so with logic and rationality. And so this little kid in their analogy sitting by himself with this old deaf captain uh, misses the mark because this kid has access to other pieces of information, which, again, they acknowledge by using the second analogy that we'll get into here in a moment. Um, I, I want to ask you, are you are you finished with your analogy? Uh, if, if so, I was going to share mine. Otherwise, I'll just stop here and let you keep talking for a minute about yours. No, I am done. I just wanted to recast this parable within the actual context in which the Rinlands are using it. But I'm dying to hear your version of the parable, Bill. So I love what you shared. I hope that mine, uh, mine can match that. I, I really find that this parable that they share, it misses the mark on multiple things, which we've kind of already hit on. Um, what I'm bothered by most is that the parable Elder Runlin shared was from one perspective. It was from the leadership of the church who look at those who have doubts as uh, being petty, as being immature, as being prideful, as being spoiled. Uh, and those, to me, are harmful. Um, I'd like to share, in a sense, the other side of the coin, which is the perspective of those of us 
who are on the outside. Uh, So let me start it this way. Some of you were born on a majestic ship. Others of you were picked up at various stops by the grand ship. And a few of you were rescued as you were stranded in the middle of the ocean. The ship was marvelous. The crew seemed kind and had answers to all of your questions. The food was delicious and deeply uh, filling, and there was enough to go back every time for seconds and thirds. You never saw the captain, but you knew from the crew's behavior that he was an awesome man. You could even feel it. The crew had rules, but the rules made sense, and they kept everyone safe. Over time, though, things began to change, and other things began to be noticed for the very first time. Over time, the ship began to show deep wear, and the crew refused to repair the boat properly. Over time, they took healthy pieces of wood from one needed spot and used it to band-aid other dilapidated areas. This, over time, made the ship smaller and smaller. You also saw the crew at time breaking the very rules they had set, and you perceived there was little safe space to raise concerns over what you were seeing. You also noticed the quality of food had gone down, and the portion sizes were getting smaller and smaller. You begin to notice that the crew is going around and asking people on the boat if they liked rainbows, and if they did, they demanded that those guests were to live down below and not to come up on top of the deck. And for those who did like rainbows who ignored the rule and came up to the deck anyway, you observed those guests were thrown overboard by the crew, and you even seen some of them eaten by sharks. You see other guests who start pointing out that the ship's condition is worsening, and that the crew is causing harm to others, and that the ship is being reduced in size, and the crew throws those guests overboard as well. For the first time, sensing this danger and the manipulation and the abuse, you decide, as a guest on this ship, for the very first time, to look off into the distance, away from the boat. Up till this point, you had kept your focus on the boat. It's all you've ever known, and it had provided so much joy at an earlier time. When you look away from the boat, you see for the first time other boats. These other boats are close enough to observe some of the things happening on those vessels. Their boats, these other boats, are in various conditions. Some better, and some worse than the ship you're on. Some of the ships seem to be throwing more people overboard off the boat than your ship, but most of them seem to be both in better condition and throwing less people off, and some of them throwing no one off, with everyone smiling and happy. You decide the only way to know what these other boats are like is to get into the water and to observe them more closely. There are sharks in the water. They're out there somewhere. But the damage and pain you see on your ship makes the risk worth taking. You jump off. As you swim to some of the other boats, you see somewhere the crew is abusing its guest in the same way that your crew abused yours telling some guests that they are unacceptable to the captain and hurting people who don't wear the right Bermuda shorts or who ask the wrong questions about where we're going. You also see other ships that the guests all seem happy and seem to be treated more fairly and lovingly than your ship's guests were. At this point, you look back at your own ship and you now sense just how dilapidated it is. It appears to be about a tenth of its original size due to all of the makeshift repairs done improperly. It has broken pieces and cracked windows and appears to be taking on water. You see, too, that some of the people who were thrown off your ship have made their way to other vessels, and they are yelling out to you that the ship they are now on is much better, that it treats people kinder. You decide to get aboard one of these other happier more healthy ships. And while you've done that, though the crew on the old ship that you came from, all they do is spend their time diminishing and marginalizing and shaming those who jump off the ship. But until you're on one of the other vessels, you simply can't know how good some of those other ships are. So that's the parable that I wrote simply to express for those who look at what the Runlands shared and said, like, that doesn't represent me. That doesn't speak about what my story looks like. 
And it's completely unfair to paint these people as uh, in some way like spoiled or they expected too much. Um, they, they were so prideful. All they wanted to do is sit. Like this just feeds into the false stereotypes. And I think we ought to honor those who in the search for truth uh, move a distance away from Mormonism and move towards something else. I've always said this. I've said this with you on episodes. We praise, we applaud, we, we take these people by the hand and take them up to the rostrum, the pulpit, and have them share their testimonies when they leave some other church and come into ours. But the moment somebody leaves Mormonism or distances themselves from Mormonism or loses faith in Mormonism, we shame, we marginalize, we diminish we don't have a single healthy story of people who leave, and I think that has to change. Right, and now we've taken it from the specific examples of Thomas Marsh and Simon's writer and generalized it by this parable to all people who leave the church. I did notice a couple of other things. By the way, I think that was a great parable that you came up with on your own there, Bill. I think that has more validity to it than the one that the Renlunds share. Uh, I do note that in their parable, they talk about there being dings in the dinghy uh, that are dense and chipped pain and all these other minor problems. The point here from their point of view is that we'll admit that there are problems, but that they are minor problems. By the way, we're never going to really talk about what those dents represent. We're not going to talk about what that peeling paint represents. We're not going to talk about what the captain being hard of hearing represents or even the, the crackers in the water being stale represent but the important point is not to really get into details god forbid we should actually talk about any of the issues but that these are all small problems that are not going to affect the boat from getting you to shore eventually also note that even though we're playing the audio and we can't see the cartoon the animation that when the boy gets off the boat and he's left there by the fisherman we see shark fins start emerging in the water and there's lightning in the distance because a storm is coming. So this also plays into fear tactics, that this boy, anybody who leaves the church, is going to be eaten by sharks and is going to have a storm come their way. My experience has been, though, that having left the boat, I was warned about all these horrible things in the water and what would happen to me, just as the Renlands will be warning their audience tonight. My experience, though, was that the water was not as cold as I was told it would be, that the sharks were not as ravenous as I was told they would be, the storms were not as tempestuous as I was told they would be. And I found out that actually I could survive it on my own. And more importantly than that, I found that there were bits and pieces of wood floating in the water from which I could construct my own boat and become my own captain. And that is definitely not what the church wants you to know. Yeah. And there's plenty of Evian water out there for people to enjoy off the boat. As you point out, RFM, as we stepped away from attendance at church a little over a year ago, and uh, our family having been excommunicated, well, me being excommunicated and our, our, the rest of my family having resigned uh, immediately following that, our family is doing well. Like, you know, I, I was certainly nervous uh, two years ago, three years ago, as I saw this day coming. And I thought, oh my goodness, what happens? What if I, what if the church is right and we, we step away from the church and everything goes downhill? Uh, what I will tell you is that my children are emotionally more stable. Um, a couple of my kids had some serious issues from what they were experiencing at church. One of my children, uh, who has expressed that they're bisexual, uh, experienced a lot of uh, shame at church. What I found was that as we stepped away, not only the emotional stability of some things that were a little more shaky at an earlier time had become, but our family is more happy our children seem more well-rounded. Uh, my marriage with my wife has improved. My own happiness and peace of mind uh, has uh, grown. 
And I can't say enough. Again, I, I don't want to belittle or demean the idea that some people do leave the church and they experience rough patches. No doubt of that, because that's that's the human journey. That's life. But I think far and wide, as I've reached out now and made new friendships and am in contact with others who uh, have stepped away from the church, I find that generally speaking, that group is collectively more happy and more fulfilled with life now that they've stepped away. Well, I think so, because the natural order of things is that once boys and girls grow up, they start wanting to take control of their life and not be forever under the thumb of a deaf sea captain. Yeah, and I think you saying like, look, I can build my own ship and I can be the captain of my own ship. That too is the human journey. At some point, we have to take back our own authority. And I think too... A big thing with this is looking around and noticing that other faiths do these same things. Like Jehovah's Witness, they scare their members into not leaving as well. Seventh-day Adventists, Scientology, all of these other religions look at their members and try to scare them from leaving and say, if you leave, things are going to get really bad for you. And then they demean and marginalize and shame those who leave. And sometimes that feels so real inside your own faith system. But once you can take a look out and see that other religious systems are doing those same things, you can kind of begin to put in place that your system is only doing what other systems do to scare people into staying. Yes, when you look at this parable and suddenly realize that this parable could be used by any church to retain members of their church, then you start understanding that it is not a very effective parable. It's a wood tool. Exactly. Wood tool made out of a wood boat with dents in it. Yeah, and and again, I I still am chuckling from the very beginning on this idea that for the first time ever, the church has painted itself as a dilapidated dinghy that goes in circles with a captain who takes his hand off the wheel and is deaf to the concerns of the uh, guest on his boat. Isn't that incredible? This is how far... (laughs) This is how far we have come in the past 20 years. And this is a reflection of the information that is getting out there by the internet, the true correct information which the church has spent its history trying to keep its members from finding out about. And now they have to respond to that by saying, we're not a carnival cruise liner, we're just a dilapidated dinghy. But we'll get you there. Just trust us. Yeah, just trust us. (laughs) Just the dinghy. <laughs> Sorry, I just I think it's hilarious. This, this this just this tiny little boat looks like it's about four foot long and about two and a half foot wide and barely seats these two people. And <laughs> the captain's probably in the early stages of dementia. Uh, the boat has got serious issues with it, uh, and the captain doesn't listen. Uh, this boat goes in circles, and the boat has serious damage to it. I know. And you start wondering, because you start learning about church history and you start saying, is this captain really a captain? Does he really know what he's doing? Does he really know where he's going? Are his promises that he can get me after I die to shore something that I can rely on? Well, you're supposed to ignore all that. Just trust this deaf captain and everything will work out fine. That's it. Just trust. And on the other side, once we die, it'll all work itself out. Exactly. Are you ready to go on with the recording? Let's let's do it. Those who serve in the church, though not perfect, are essential to help and encourage us along the covenant path. What do the boat and the fishermen teach us about the church? Do dents and peeling paint on the church change its ability to provide the authorized saving and exalting ordinances to help us become like our Heavenly Father? If the fishermen must hold on to the rudder with both hands to keep the boat on course— Does that negate his and the boat's ability to get us safely and reliably where we want to go? You do not have to be an ordained seer like my husband to know that slipping back into the water instead of staying in the boat is risky. Yet, when we lose sight of the big picture, the small dance and peeling paint can loom large in our minds. Every member needs his or her own witness of the truthfulness of the restored church. Without a true conversion, including a mighty change of heart, you may begin to focus on the metaphorical soda crackers and chip paint. 
President Russell M. Nelson in April Conference 2018 said, You don't have to wonder about what is true. You do not have to wonder whom you can safely trust. Through personal revelation, you can receive your own witness that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and that this is the Lord's Church. Regardless of what others may say or do, no one can ever take away a witness born to your heart and mind about what is true. This witness is more crucial now than it has ever been. This part continues to send the mixed message that we hear so often from the church. She quotes President Nelson saying, you do not need to wonder who you can safely trust. So long as you get a witness from God that we're the ones that you can trust. It's this idea of you don't have to wonder about who you can safely trust because you can get this revelation from God saying you can safely trust us. And as Elder Oak said recently, if you get a revelation from God that's different from trusting us, i.e. the leaders of the church, then you can know that that revelation was not from God. So this is how they play both ends against the middle. You're entitled to receive a revelation that we are prophets of God and that we speak for God. But if you receive a different revelation than that, then that revelation is not from God. Yeah, and on top of that, there's this comment by her in there uh, from President Nelson that we are all to get this sure witness of the Book of Mormon, this sure witness of of this work, sure witness of these leaders. Um, and then I find it ironic that it's juxtaposed against Elder Rundland here in a moment. Uh, he's going to tell us that he couldn't get that sure witness but that he had to decide within himself that he just knew he just always knew it was true, uh, and therefore he had to give up on having this great experience of testimony. Yes, this is a secondary theme in this talk that comes out where you're supposed to get this sure witness, but it's okay if you don't get this sure witness because my husband, the ordained seer, hasn't gotten a sure <laughs> witness either. But if you just keep doing everything we tell you to do, then by the end of your life and after the end of your life, you'll finally find out that it really was true after all. Not all of us can be ordained seers, RFM. Nope, we can't, but some of us can be married to them. <laughs> I will say too, just a little side note, is that they put the two of them up there together, which I think is great. I think it's a, I think that is a good move by the church to have husband and wife, leader and his spouse, be together uh, working jointly as a team. And I think it gives the image to the young women of the church that there's a higher level of equality today in the church than there was. Same thing with the temple changes they recently made. I would note, though, that, be, however, behind the scenes, Sister Runlin goes home, does the laundry, cleans the house, and does whatever other things she does. Meanwhile, her husband still goes to the church office building and builds the kingdom of God. There still is a discrepancy in the rubber meets the road, but I do want to at least acknowledge that the appearance of working together at a fireside uh, and giving the image of equality in spite of one having authority and building the kingdom uh, in a leadership position and the other having to do it from some other location uh, also is somewhat uh, a piece of irony to me. Yes, I, I think you're right. This is a good move. And also accentuating the positive here for a second, I think that Elder Renlund's wife, Ruth, does not appear to be actually scared of her husband like Elder Bednar's wife is. No, no. She does not have the fear of God in her face when she stands up before her husband does. No, that's that's, no. that's definitely the case. Or when her husband holds up a bottle of Evian water. Or, or smacks his binder when she does make a first move. <laughs> now, these are all sort of inside jokes. Hopefully the audience gets them. We're not going to go into detail about them. But yes, these are all things that have to do with Elder Bednar's wife. Yeah, you could just do a simple Google search with Elder Bednar, wife, and scared, and I'm sure that those will be the first three or four videos that come up. Right. So once again, going back to the positive, we, we got off the track there, Bill, went to the negative. <laughs> My fault. Ruth Renlund does not appear to be that way with her husband. They seem to have a very nice relationship, and I think some of that comes across even under the strained and somewhat artificial circumstances of this presentation where they're both reading off a teleprompter. Yeah. And I think this, I hope this move continues. I hope to see going forward 
the leaders of the church standing with their wives. And I hope we go an additional step further, which is to have the leaders of the church that are male stand next to the leaders of the church that are female and begin to do firesides and presentations where the Relief Society and primary and young women's presidencies of the church have what appears to be an equal say as they present ideas and concepts to the members of the church. Yes. And you know, it does occur to me, Bill, and I hope this doesn't sound too nitpicky, that the idea is that all that's available on this boat for the fishermen and for this boy are stale crackers and water. And yet the thought did just occur to me that they're speaking from Hawaii, that they flew over to Hawaii together, that they flew over first class, and that they had the best that there was to offer by way of meals on the airplane. My guess is they might have even drank some Evian and Pierre water. Uh, even Perrier water. Oh, sorry, that, Perrier, that'd be sorry. The, th- that's the French pronunciation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it, really, this analogy of the boat ends up becoming a little bit more tilted because the kid has to drink the stale water and the stale crackers. Meanwhile, the captain, the kindly captain, is traveling first class, and he's the one who gets the Evian water and the delicatessen meat followed by a chocolate croissant. Yeah, my my gut tells me, and, and I think these guys live a moderate level of luxury, and I think that they enjoy the best things in life. I know that For instance, Elder Uchtdorf, there's a picture of him from General Conference wearing an extremely high-end watch, about a $6,000 watch. Now, I know he was an airline uh, pilot, and I know he made a good living. Uh, But these men, for the most part, seem to come out of careers where they made a good living. And I think the church takes very good care of them. And I think that they have at least some of the best things of life around them. And so painting the captain of the ship... uh, as just this poor, dilapidated fisherman himself, I think doesn't do justice to the reality. I think these men wear nice suits, they have nice cars, they have nice homes and multiple homes and multiple cars. They get free health insurance, they get a stipend of about $130,000 a year now. Um, I think all of those things play into uh, the fact that they're pointing at the member with doubts as being spoiled. And I think it isn't it a fair analogy unless you also include that the leaders of the church on some level are also spoiled? Yeah. So as I say, that's a thought that just occurred to me at this point. But I think that we are able to move on at this point. The beginning of my testimony occurred when I lived in Göteborg, Sweden. I was 11 years old. The mission president issued an invitation to all young people to read the Book of Mormon. I accepted that challenge and started to read. Somewhere in my reading, one of the mission president's counselors told us we should pray about what we read. I remember very well the evening I acted on that invitation. I knelt at the bedside and began a very simple prayer to know whether the Book of Mormon is true. I didn't hear a voice, but it was as if God told me, I've been telling you all along that it's true. That experience changed me. It changed my life. It began a process of belief, a process of being on the covenant path and trying to do more and trying to do better. It was in Yotibori that I learned how to repent. It was in Yotibori that I came to a knowledge of my Redeemer. It was in Yotibori that I began looking up to individuals who magnified their callings and who worked hard to build up the kingdom of God. Yotibori became my Waters of Mormon. This story by Elder Renland about how he gained his testimony is problematic to me. Now, first off, I want to say I don't want to be too judgmental about another person's spiritual experience because I allow anybody to have whatever spiritual experience they have. I believe what they say. I have had experiences that I cannot explain in any natural way. And so I allow that latitude to other people. My concern here, though, is that this is a refrain I am hearing more and more often in the church, which is that when a person does not get an answer to their prayer, then suddenly the non-answer becomes the answer to their prayer. Frequently, I hear young adults especially 
take the stand in testimony meeting and they talk about praying to get their testimony of the Book of Mormon or whatever it is. And they pray and they pray and they pray and they pray and they don't get an answer. And finally, they come to the realization, Bill. They come to the realization that they have known all along that it's true. And the answer of they've known all along that it's true is the fill in the blank for why it is they never got an answer. Well, they never got an answer because, oh my gosh, well, I've always known it's true. Therefore, that explains why I'm not getting an answer. Now, this is exactly the kind of thing I'm hearing from Elder Rinland's story. He says he was 11 years old in Uteboy, Sweden, I believe, and he starts reading the Book of Mormon because a member of the mission presidency recommended it to the youth. He says somewhere while he's reading in the Book of Mormon, he hasn't completed the Book of Mormon. We're left to wonder how far he's gotten. But he's, while he's reading the Book of Mormon somewhere in First Nephi, presumably, somebody else tells him he should pray about it. So one night, just one night, Bill, he gets down on his knees, he prays, and he doesn't say how long he prays. I'm going to guess it's for a while, but he's clear. He doesn't hear the voice of God. He doesn't hear a voice, but it is as if he heard a voice saying, you have always known that it's true. Now, that's a remarkable statement. This is the same kind of story that I was alluding to earlier. And it's kind of funny to me to hear an 11-year-old say that you've always known it's true. I mean, always is kind of a short period of time when you're talking about being an 11-year-old praying about the Book of Mormon. So what I am taking from this is that Elder Rinland gets a non-answer to his prayer. He interprets it as an answer to his prayer, and that is the basis of his testimony. Now, please notice he goes on to say that it was in Yutaboy that he gained this testimony of the Book of Mormon, which is really just the understanding and realization that he always knew it was true, even though he's not apparently getting an answer directly to his prayer when he prays about its truthfulness. But he then goes on to say it was in Utaboy that he came to a knowledge of his Redeemer. So this is how things leapfrog. We read from the Book of Mormon, some from the Book of Mormon, not the entire Book of Mormon, apparently. He prays about it when he's 11. He doesn't get an answer, but he realizes he's always known. And now that becomes his coming to a knowledge of his Redeemer. So we can see how an unanswered prayer of a partially read book now becomes a certain knowledge that Jesus is the Christ. A certain knowledge that Jesus is the Christ for an ordained seer. Exactly. And this was when this ordained seer was just 11 years old. So heaven only knows what he's experienced since then. That's left to our imagination. But the one story he tells us is a non-story in that sense. And I think it has another purpose, Bill. I think the purpose is, is that we are now giving permission to the young adults that are being addressed that it's okay if you don't get an answer to your prayer about the Book of Mormon being true because I didn't either and you can come to the same realization that I did that even without getting an answer that you've always known it's true as well. Yeah, when I was 17 and the missionaries came to teach me, there were, it was set up differently. The gospel, uh, what's the what's the missionary book called? The Preach My Gospel. So the Preach My Gospel book wasn't yet written from the other side to, as President Packer said, um, that book was gone. That wasn't, that wasn't in existence yet. Uh, it was still being worked on by angels on the other side of the veil. The missionary system was six missionary discussions. And the first one started off with, most of us believe in a supreme being. And though we call him by different names, we know that God lives. And then they would proceed to teach the first discussion. And then the rule then was by the end of the second discussion, you would try to commit somebody to baptism. In the meantime, you boldly, courageously preach to the people who are investigating the church to pray about the things that you were being taught, to read the Book of Mormon, to listen to these discussions, and to pray about them, and God would undoubtedly answer your prayer. We would turn to Moroni, chapter 10, 3 through 5, and to pray about the church, and I would be given an answer. Like, this was the challenge, and it was bold. And I remember going out with the missionaries as a newly baptized member and having this joy of confidence in knowing that God answers prayers and that we could challenge these people to pray about it. And if they carried through on what was being asked of them, 
God would absolutely no questions asked give them an answer. And as you point out, it feels as though the church is backing away from that and and making this stance, which I think scripturally has always been there. This idea that some will know by some spectacular experience and others will need to just rely on uh, others' words or just a knowledge that, hey, I've always known it's been true, even if I've never had any kind of special experience. Well, I think that the church has gone there. I think you can find other texts, like in the Doctrine and Covenants, which will also be referenced later on in this talk. But I do have to note that the promise in the Book of Mormon, often called Moroni's promise, is unequivocal. That if one prays with full intent of heart, nothing doubting, and remembers how merciful God has been unto the children of men from the days of Adam even on down, that God will manifest the truthfulness of these things, i.e. the Book of Mormon, unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost. There's no might manifest the truth of it unto you. There's no, if he feels like it, manifest the truth of it unto you. He will manifest the truth of it unto you. Yeah, there seems to be in religion generally, but I specifically see it in Mormonism, where we take multiple stances on any specific idea or issue or principle, and we allow then for the truth to be any of those various stances. Uh, And it, it happens in apologetics, Book of Abraham, there's either a missing scroll or there's a catalyst theory. Uh, It happens in the doctrine in terms of what you just pointed out, which is some places unequivocally say you'll get an answer. And in other places it says, hey, you may not get an answer. And it allows essentially all roads to lead to Rome. Right. And if I can just go back to this story once again, I don't mean to be too hard on Elder Renland, but as I'm actually thinking about his story, it is making less and less sense. He's 11 years old. He's never read the Book of Mormon before. He receives this challenge from a leader to read the Book of Mormon. He starts reading the Book of Mormon, and before he's completed it, once again, we don't know how far he got, doubtless before Second Nephi, right? But before he finishes it, he gets the challenge to pray about it. He prays about it, He doesn't get an answer, but instead the answer comes that he's always known it's true. Well, wait a second. He's always known the Book of Mormon is true, even though he has never read it. You see, as I start thinking more and more about this and breaking it down, his story holds less and less together for me. Yeah, it it feels like here's a kid who went through nursery and primary and all of the, for a lack of a better word, brainwashing that happens, and, and that happens in every religious system. Every religious system sends kids off to sing songs about their church and about their version of Jesus, and the kids go home happy that they sang and had a treat and had some fun, uh, and that for Elder Ren- Renland is, uh, is his testimony. Yes, I think so. And that's the foundation of his testimony. That's what he chooses to share with the audience, and that is really what his entire testimony apparently is based on even now today as an ordained seer. Yeah, an 11-year-old who uh, had family home evening and who had uh, maybe scripture readings in his home, but these would have been uh, from various places in the scripture and not necessarily an understanding of the context of those books. And he felt good about it, and he felt good while he sang songs. And that's the, the foundational testimony, as you point out, of an ordained seer. Right, and the key to that is that he says he came to the knowledge of his Redeemer in that town through this experience. Because later on, In this talk toward the end, he's going to be saying that I know, the leaders know that Jesus is the Christ. And for those of you who don't know, that's okay. You just have to take our word for it and have faith in our testimony that we know, even when I've already shown you that my knowledge is based upon a questionable experience I had when I was 11. Yeah, don't worry about these things. Trust us. Exactly. Trust that sea captain. He'll get you to shore. Where did you come to a knowledge of your Redeemer? How did you feel? If you have forgotten, we urge you to do something to recapture the feeling. This knowledge and these feelings are the beginnings of faith. Faith is a choice that each person must make. Faith is not just whimsically wanting something to be true and fancifully convincing yourself it is. Faith is the assurance of the existence of things that we haven't seen in the flesh. Faith is also a principle of action. Faith must be centered in Jesus Christ for it to lead a person to salvation. 
And faith is kindled by hearing the gospel taught by authorized teachers sent by God. Miracles do not produce faith, but strong faith is developed by obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, faith comes by righteousness. Faith does not come from demanding signs from God, but by obeying and following his commandments. Faith is not wishing something to be true or fancifully hoping that it's true. It's something other than that. But but the reality for for me, and I think for many people that the Renlands are describing as that kid who was capsized on a boat, is that the further we look into Mormonism, at some point we ask ourselves, like, what if it's not true? What if it's not what it claims to be? And we stop wishing for it to be true. We stop fancifully hoping that it's true. And we start thinking with logic and rationality and looking at these issues. And for us, and I get that there are some people who dive into the issues and they are able to maintain faith. I think those are few and far between, but I grant that they're there. I think for the far and wide majority, and certainly for myself, it was when I stopped thinking wishfully. It's when I stopped fancifully thinking that it all went back together is when I realized like, oh, this absolutely isn't what it claims to be. In the moment, I allowed the conclusion to be that just grant this doesn't add up and the conclusion is something other than what the church is saying, it's then when all the pieces fell into place. It's then when everything made sense. It's then when all the data could be accounted for. And so I don't, I don't find what she's saying here to represent like reality. She's, she's essentially making the believer's argument, which is for those who emotionally need to stay, they emotionally need it to be true. They've never considered the idea like, what if it isn't? And let me look at the data objectively. Like there's a lot of fanciful thinking and wishful thinking from a believer's perspective. And I think we need to at least grant that for many members of the church, this is very much something that they want and need to be true. And there is some wishful and fanciful thinking involved. Yeah, I think it's especially ironic given the fact that her husband has just talked about his experience in which he fancifully wished and believed that the Book of Mormon was true because of his experience when he was 11. Also, notice how she starts off with a leading question. These are objectionable in a court of law. Her question is, where did you come to a knowledge of your Redeemer? You see how that is a leading question. The answer is already in the question that you have come to a knowledge of your Redeemer. Everybody that she's speaking to has already come to a knowledge of their Redeemer. That is the assumption on her part, and that is the part that she does not even want to allow for the possibility that the audience has not come to a knowledge of their Redeemer. So once having said, you've come to a knowledge of your Redeemer, now when did it happen? She wants to make sure that they are thinking that they have already come to a knowledge of their Redeemer too, with the hope that that will get them to believe it. So this is something that the church does frequently, especially in its manuals, where they have questions for the teachers to ask the class. They always or almost always have leading questions in them of this sort. When did you come to a knowledge of your Redeemer? Instead of simply asking, have you come to a knowledge of your Redeemer. Now, to the Book of Mormon's credit, in Alma chapter 5, probably the second longest chapter in the Book of Mormon in which a sermon of Alma is contained, he spends the first half of his discourse asking his audience, at least giving them the respect, even if it's a fictional book, giving them the respect of asking, have you come to a knowledge of your Redeemer? And spending the last half saying, if you have come to a knowledge of your Redeemer, I ask, can you feel so now? But she doesn't even want to go to the first half of the discourse. She's going to jump right to the second half and assume that everybody has received that knowledge of their Redeemer. Finally, at the end of the segment by Sister Renlund, she talks about miracles do not come by asking. That's sign seeking. We don't ask for signs in the church. Faith doesn't come by miracles. Instead, faith comes by doing what the captain of the boat tells you to do by being obedient by being faithful. That's how faith comes. Now, this is once again a strange juxtaposition in Mormonism because as you said, and as she's going to say now later on, 
where she's going to quote from Verona chapter 10 verses 3 and 4 is what she'll quote. The entire missionary effort and the Book of Mormon itself is based upon the idea that we do ask for a sign from God, that we ask him to reveal to us by the power of the Holy Ghost that the Book of Mormon is true. That's asking for a sign with the promise that the sign will be given. That is a miracle, Bill. When God communicates to an individual, that is by definition a miracle. So the whole foundation of Mormonism is based upon the idea of asking for a specific sign and getting a specific miraculous answer in response to that request. And yet there is this other thread which she is now promoting, which is that faith does not come by asking for signs, even though the Book of Mormon specifically says it does. No, instead... Faith comes by doing what the leaders of the church tell you to do. And it will come eventually, even if you have to at some point realize, oh, I've known all along it was true, and you don't actually get a real revelation. Yeah, Moroni 10, 3 through 5 is sign-seeking. On the other side of this, too, something else that kind of caught my eye is this idea of asking a question of where did you come to uh, a testimony of the Savior? This, And again, I don't know the exact member framing that she, she issued, but it's this idea that where it happened is how you know which church is true. That's how she's using it. She is essentially asking the young people in that crowd to say like, hey, at some point you had an experience with God and what church were you in when you had that experience? Well, duh, everybody in that crowd had it within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But the reality is that there are people all across the planet who have foundational experiences regarding Jesus Christ and those folks are in other faith systems. So if, again, you are a Methodist and you've had your foundational experience in the Methodist church, does that mean that Methodism is true? No, it doesn't. And so her question is not only leading the witness, it's also misleading the witness. You're right, Bill. We talked earlier about leading questions and why they are not admissible in a court of law because they assume the answer in the question. There is also another form of leading question that is even worse, which is called a misleading question. A misleading question not only assumes the answer in the question, it assumes the answer that is contradicted by the evidence that is already given. The classic example of a misleading question is, when did you stop beating your wife? Although in Elder Bednar's case, it might not be a misleading question at all. But as you say, asking where did you first come to a knowledge of your Redeemer may be a misleading question if the person being asked has not indeed ever come to a knowledge of their Redeemer. Well, it looks like this is going to be a multi-part podcast because there is still a lot more to dissect and analyze in the Renlund's devotional, including their second parable involving church history, whack-a-mole. Because the first parable that they have given involves a boat that out of love was stopped to pick up a poor stranded boy and save him from drowning. 